Hi, and welcome back. Quantum computing gives and quantum computing takes away. On the one hand, there's the possibility of breaking kind of all factor-based encryption technologies. But on the other hand, there's the promise of uneavesdroppable communication through entangled photons. Our next speaker wants to break these, I mean, test the security of these systems using high-powered lasers and fancy, super well-rigged telescopes. Along the way, you'll hear stories of tons of broken fiber optic cable. Please join me in welcoming to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Dr. Sarah Kaiser. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am so excited to be here and share, uh, share with you some of the work that I did actually for my PhD. Um, which did involve lots of high-powered lasers. <laughs> um, so I know there's stereotypes of like crazy cat ladies. I feel like I'm, I'd like to make a new one for crazy laser ladies. <laughs> um, so my background is in experimental quantum optics and now I work as a research engineer for an engineering consulting firm called Pensar Development in Seattle. Um, and in my spare time, I do a lot of uh, writing, <laughs> um, <clears throat> specifically trying to take technical topics uh, and break them down for a variety of age groups, so everything from babies to <laughs> um, to my colleagues. Uh, so, but the, really, the story of uh, the technology we want to talk about today is quantum technology. Um, we saw in the last talk a lot of really amazing examples of hardware side channels for classical technology, um, <clears throat> but quantum technology is kind of the next next big thing. Um, Mostly, you've probably heard of quantum computers, um, but there's really lots of different things you can do with this technology. You can make uh, better sensors. You can uh, even improve information security. Uh, so as the introduction alluded to, um, quantum computers can give and take. Uh, one of the most interesting things we've figured out how to do, or one of the most interesting algorithms we figured out that we could do with them um, allows us to factor, factor large numbers, which is kind of a problem when a lot of our cryptographic infrastructure assumes that factoring large numbers is a difficult thing for computers. But on the other hand, we can use the same technology and actually make our cryptographic infrastructure better. Um, we can't necessarily replace all of it, but what we're going to specifically focus on here is the key exchange part of uh, cryptographic protocols. So um, there's encryption, there's certification, lots of other things that you can do, but usually they all start with sharing a secret with another party. So how do we actually go about doing this? Um, also, fun fact, that's a real picture from one of the setups we had to do outside. It was very demoralizing that the only clearing in the trees was also right in front of this very <laughs> ominous sign. <laughs> um, just really, like, the first year of your PhD, it's like, this is not, not good, <laughs> not good signaling. Um, so, quantum key distribution. Our objective here is to share a key between two parties, canonically called, Alice and Bob, but insert your favorite characters here. Um, we need two things to do this. One, a quantum channel between Alice and Bob, which in real life uh, is basically an optical fiber, or as you saw with the telescopes, free space. Um, but the commercial devices we'll be looking at here are optically are connected with optical fiber. And the quantum systems you'll be using are uh, single photons. So it turns out that when you kind of subdivide light down to its smallest part, uh, the energy in a single photon is so small that it behaves according to quantum mechanics as opposed to, well, regular mechanics. <laughs> um, so um, you also need, sorry, the, the other thing we need for this protocol is a classical link between Alice and Bob. This does not need to be uh, hidden or secret, but it does have to be authenticated. So you can, you can use the internet, you can text, doesn't really matter, they just need a way of coordinating as a part of the protocol at some point. Um, so, what we're going to focus on, though, for the side channel that we'll be exploiting for this, this protocol is the quantum part. Because as uh, we saw with the Sammy's talk previously, there's lots of good ways to deal with the, the classical link here. Um, so what we want to actually look at is what is new about these quantum crypto devices, which is the quantum link. Um, <clears throat> so with all of this, you might say, all right, well, we already have the classical link here. Why are we even bothering with the quantum part? Like, I've just said it's better. <laughs> um, well, 
what you're able to attest with a quantum key distribution system over any other classical key distribution method um, is provable security. So normally when you try to write a security proof for your protocol, you have to make assumptions about what, the, what attackers can do <laughs> to your system or to your parties while you're doing the exchange. Um, so whether that's like how much time they have or what computing resources they have available. Um, but with quantum key distribution, all you have to assume is that they're bound by the speed of light and the laws of physics, which generally speaking, if your attacker is not bound by those things, we have a much bigger problem and uh, security doesn't matter at that point. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have some resources here at the bottom if you wanna learn more about QKD in general. We're gonna focus on a specific protocol, so there's lots of different you know, kind of like anything without a standard yet, there are lots of different ways you can implement it, um, kind of like risk five before risk five. Um, and so here we'll be looking at one specifically called BB84. That part doesn't really matter so much. Um, but what are the actual steps for this quantum channel between Alice and Bob? So the first step is Alice is going to prepare her photons in one of four random states. Um, it is important that these are cho chosen randomly, so she actually will also have a quantum random number generator <laughs> in her device. Um, and I, you can see these depicted here as like top, bottom, left, and right. Um, this is just an easier way to draw things, but uh, for the actual photons, there's different degrees of freedom that you could use. So you could do this at uh, different settings for the color of the photon. You could do different phases for the photons. You could do different polarization angles. Um, there are lots of different systems will use different um, degrees of freedom, but uh, we can generalize and just say four different settings. <laughs> um, so she'll send a string of these randomly selected settings, uh, photons, uh, to Bob. And then Bob can choose uh, one of two uh, measurement settings for, on his side. So he can't actually distinguish all four of these perfectly. So he has to choose basically whether he's going to measure the top bottom setting or the left right setting. Um, and he's also, because he doesn't know ahead of time what uh, setting Alice is sending, because that's kind of like the whole point, that's the key. <laughs> um, so he's also going to choose randomly. And what that means is, uh, so if they're both choosing at random, um, it's a little bit hard to see here, but um, the about 50% of the time, his measurement setting will match up correctly with what Alice sent, and he will actually be able to measure a correct bit. Um, as to how they sort this out, like that's what you do on that classical public channel after you've exchanged all the photons. Um, that part is way less interesting to me because it doesn't involve lasers. So <laughs> um, there's definitely, you can read more about this, about the post-processing later. Um, but let's focus on how these photons are actually getting from Alice to Bob because that, this channel between the two is basically all we have access to for the side channel. I'm assuming that they have implemented their physical security well enough that I can't just walk into their lab and set something on the table next to it. <laughs> um, so what's really cool is there's actually already devices that do this that you can buy commercially. Um, so here's an example from a company called ID Quantique. Um, so you see uh, two boxes here, uh, one, it's basically one is Alice and one is Bob. Um, they're connected by optical fiber, both for the quantum channel and also for the classical communication channel. The boxes on top, uh, this company actually sells um, the best classical uh, encryption systems with it so that you can XOR the key from both the quantum part and the classical part to give you an even stronger key. So it's a good marketing tactic for them. Um, so, but what's inside this, these boxes? Because um, if we want to find a side channel, we do, like, we don't assume that we can't reverse engineer what's inside. So <laughs> we took one, we opened it up, um, and you can see our familiar boxes here, Alice and Bob, um, and lots of different types of optical components here. Uh, uh, variable attenuators, uh, photo detectors, laser diodes, um, all of this is at, uh, they're just standard telecom parts. There's not even anything fancy about this. It's just 1550 nanometers. Um, the one thing that you might note is interesting here is Alice doesn't have a light source. So for their particular implementation, what happens is Bob has a laser. Aha, also do I have a laser? <laughs> I have a laser. Um, so Bob actually has the laser and he can, he sends really bright pulses to Alice. Um, so many, many photons at once. And Alice actually just reflects that back 
and uses this attenuator here to attenuate it down to a single photon level, um, as well as use this phase modulator here um, to encode which of those four settings she's picking. So that's, it's kind of a weird thing, um, and they have technical reasons why they did this, but conceptually it's the same as the diagrams we were looking at before. Al the information is not imparted onto the photon until Alice reflects it back. Um, cool. So how do we actually exploit this side channel? Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, provable security, uh, like, like everything, no, nothing actually matches our model. <laughs> um, and there's always ways in which the hardware, once we implement it, you know, isn't, isn't fully captured in our security proofs. So one of my favorite examples of a side channel um, for this was actually one of the first uh, QKD devices implemented in um, Bell Labs at IBM in the early 90s. Uh, you could hear what settings Alice was choosing for her photons just because the rotation stages that were rotating components. Uh, so like Alice, Alice was here on this end, Bob was here on this end, and all the components here rotated and you could just listen for the key. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously their intent here was not, they were not designing for security, but it's a really, I think, funny example of, of a side channel. We got a lot more also from Sammy Sammy's talk earlier. So similarly, uh, when I started working on this problem, there were a, no a number of known attacks already. Um, things that might sound very familiar, timing attacks, um, multiple wavelength attacks. So basically you have a particular wavelength or color that the system is operating at. If you inject in at a similar but not quite the same wavelength, uh, you can get your light encoded at the same time. It will reflect back out and then you can separate it on the line in between and then you can basically just read out what Alice or Bob is doing. Um, but kind of the attack that we were inspired by was a detector control attack. So how this worked was actually found by accident, <laughs> but basically um, if you shine low power laser light at Bob's detector system, so at his kind of, his two measurement settings, um, and then pulse selectively on top of that, uh, you can basically make him detect whatever you like. <laughs> um, and what that, it leaves it readily open for like a man in the middle attack. Um, so you could then just sit, pretend you're Bob, make your measurements and then make the real Bob have the same measurements that you just made. Normally this wouldn't be possible because um, one of the parts of, the reason why you'd use quantum systems for this is uh, called the no cloning Print, uh, property, so you can't arbitrarily copy a random quantum system. So that's kind of what ensures the security of your, of your quantum systems going in between the two. Um, so because all of these attacks were already known, they of course attempted countermeasures to these. <laughs> so what we wanted to do was actually say, all right, were these countermeasures enough? Can we, uh, kind of like the last thing Sammy also talked about of just putting the capacitor across, can you just disable them. Um, so here's the same diagram that we were looking at before, um, but now I've put in what actually they uh, did to act as a countermeasure to a lot of those attacks, which is basically to put some monitoring uh, photodiodes watching the incoming light to Alice. So uh, basically in this area here. And what's interesting to note about this is 90% of the incoming light into Alice goes into this system. So that kind of made us start thinking, um, maybe we should get the lasers. <laughs> um, so if 90% of the light is into the system is going into this monitoring section, if we had a high enough powered laser, maybe we could melt that system <laughs> or disable it in some way and actually uh, leave the rest of the system intact. So that was basically what we set out to do. So the first thing we had to do was actually take all of those components in those boxes uh, that the light was going to interact with and figure out what their actual power damage threshold was. <laughs> because there's always the data sheet, and then you know, that's probably three times you know, either lower or higher than what they think it actually can handle, but what can it really handle? <laughs> um, then if, if that came out successful, then we wanted to actually look at those um, series of three photodiodes, which have a variety of different kind of readout electronics behind them, um, looking for different properties of the incoming signal. If we, so what we wanted to do was, can we craft a laser pulse that will disable the right combination of them so that it doesn't raise alarms? And if both of those work, 
figure out what you know Goldilocks setting Goldilocks setting for our attack laser we could use to actually disable the system and then try a full attack. So fortunately, lab equipment is very judgy. <laughs> this is a fiber splicer, uh, which I did have to use a lot. Um, <clears throat> so some of the components that we actually had to test, so if, if we're gonna get this laser power in there, the parts before the detectors better not break. Um, so we have things like the actual fiber itself, the connectors, um, you can see I'm wearing some of the, kind of like a hunter puts, puts their trophy somewhere, I'm wearing a bunch of them. <laughs> um, splitters, attenuators, and what we actually, long story short, what we found was we couldn't break them. Like, we took, I went, uh, took all of our lab equipment to a lab that had a 75 watt free space CW laser at 1550, which uh, just for context, like most laser pointers are five milliwatts. So this is 75 watts. Um, we had a really hard time coupling this labor, laser into fiber because as you focused it down, the air was heating up so much that the end of the fiber was vibrating and we could not actually get the power into the fiber. Um, so with however much power we were able to get in there, none of these components broke, um, which was a little uh, disappointing to me, so we obviously tried to push it farther <laughs> um, and discovered an interesting new effect that we definitely did not want to trigger as a part of this. So you can see here we're taking the raw end of a fiber, rubbing it on the table, uh, and starting this really cool glowy bit. Um, which is called a fiber fuse. So kind of like, you know, you leave a gunpowder trail along the uh, ground. This fuse is a plasma fire in the glass that propagates back towards the laser source itself. To me, it, it seems counterintuitive because the laser's going forward, but it's actually consuming the energy back towards the laser source. Um, and one of the neat things that also, <laughs> neat and also very bad things that happens as a function of this of, is, so here's an, just a microscope picture of an optical fiber. Uh, after that fuse goes by, you get all of these really amazing little perfectly periodic bubbles. Um, and the periodicity of these bubbles, or the spacing, is basically, is directly proportional to, proportional to how much energy over the threshold you were to start the plasma fire at that location. So you can see here, uh, it actually varies a little bit more uh, in, just a little different place in the fiber. So I was very happy we, met, we broke a lot of fiber this way, <laughs> but it is entirely unusable after this. Like the loss induced by these bubbles in the core is just, so as a part of our attack, we definitely didn't want this to happen, but we totally wanted this to happen some of the times. <laughs> um, so that was good, on to step two. Um, we have a, uh, so we wanted to test these diodes. So we just set up a little kind of characterization rig here where we have a um, characterizing laser that would kind of stimulate it in the same way that the regular system would. Uh, we set up a damaging laser and basically we'd alternate, we'd characterize it to start with, we'd damage it, and then characterize it again to see what actually happened. And we iterated through many, many different combinations of like continuous laser light, do we pulse it, do we like, ramp up slowly. Um, so to show you kind of some of the best results from that, uh, here is a new detector, a pin, so it's just a pin photodiode. Um, you can see the two pins, the sensor itself, and the little gold bonding wire. Um, after one of our more successful attacks, you can see this puddle, <laughs> uh, and it's kind of hard to see, but the bonding wire is entirely off <laughs> and disconnected, so this failed in an open circuit fashion, which was ideal for us. Um, looking a little bit closer at this, uh, you can see this is like top down on the sensor. Um, here we are actually with kind of a, I think this was pulsed laser light at a, like kind of a lower power. Um, we were able to actually decrease the sensitivity of the photodiode, so actually it still operated, but we could reduce its sensitivity by like 15 to 25%, which will be important. Um, or we can cause catastrophic damage and hope that, uh, so the picture you saw before, it failed in an open circuit way. We also had some where they fused in a closed circuit. That was less helpful, um, and it's just kind of statistical whether, which of those two cases happened. Um, but I think from this, that'll work. <laughs> so what conditions did we actually want to try and attack on here? Um, we could, we could try to go for the full key, which is fully disabling this monitoring system, but we have this kind of 
statistical chance of is it going to fail, open, or close. Um, so we obviously took that one option. <laughs> but in a more realistic sense, you could also try to go for partial key, um, where you just reduce the sensitivity of that sensor. Um, and that allows you to inject some of your own light in again. And that opens up like kind of a Trojan horse style attack or the multi-wavelength multi attack. So we actually tried this on our running system. So all, all of the testing prior to this was on copies of components outside the boxes because that was like a half million dollar system. I was not about to put that much optical power in and potentially risk all of my PhD results. So uh, this was a very, very anxious time. But you can see here we've got, oh, uh, wrong laser button. Uh, so here's time of the attack. Um, and orange line here is basically the key that's in the buffer of the system. So it goes up in steps because um, each time you get to the end of the key distillation phase, or that's basically the classical communication they do afterwards, um, they figure out what, what key they actually got from that and add it to the buffer. Um, so you can see the system started up. It did some calibration, got some key. Uh, here's where we launched our attack. Um, and then you can see it actually just continued on its merry way and kept <laughs> accumulating key into the buffer. If it had actually failed and raised an alarm, uh, the orange line would have gone to zero because it would have dumped the buffer and it would have just sat there in like a wee woo, wee woo, wee woo mode <laughs> until someone came in and reset it. Um, so yeah, it was entirely successful. Um, so what, <laughs> what, did, what did we learn from this? Um, well, I learned that brute force is sometimes the best force. <laughs> um, no, everyone I talked to about this, like at conferences and stuff, when we were working on this, they were like, this is a really dumb idea. Like, obviously, you're going to break something else before the stuff you want to break breaks. And I was like, mm, I don't know. Maybe we should just try it. <laughs> um, and it, it's a testament to the engineering of all the other components in these boxes that were just so well engineered that they actually survived this. <laughs> um, so. Brute force is the best force. Um, these physical side channels uh, can compromise even the best security. Um, and yeah, <laughs> that it's nice to have provable security, but really, in real, it, these are always going to be implemented with real hardware, and we really need like a validation. You know, basically, quantum uh, key distribution is now at a stage where we kind of need to adopt some standards and and validation labs to actually move forward, which leads into the last bit, um, quantum hardware and software needs your guys' expertise. <laughs> um, speaking, like coming from the physics side where we actually, like a lot of these devices have spent most of their life, just like myself, in a lab, uh, they're not necessarily ready for the real world yet. Um, and especially in a lot of the designing of the electronics and, um, and the software and the, and the firmware and FPGAs for, like it's a really exciting area and I encourage you to get interested. Um, Talk to me more uh, later today or on Twitter if you want to learn more. But I'm always excited to talk about this. <laughs> and melt things with lasers. Thanks. <laughs>